But today we have Shepherd of the Argonne. Uh, George is going to be doing what's called an alternative history. Uh, it's alternative history of naval battles of World War II. Uh, we were talking earlier about my time with the RAF, and he starts saying, well, we got this in here, and so on and so forth. So he draws from every warfare community, except CBs, I think. I don't know. He maybe has something on CBs in there. Not yet. Uh, he's a retired Navy captain. He was the chairman of the JMO department, uh, late 90s. Late 90s, 94 to 99. There you go. So, and I retired in 94, so that just sort of lets you know. <laughs> but anyway. Uh... Now, in 1906, there was a revolution in naval design, the dreadnought. And all of the countries began building dreadnought battleships. However, those previous German laws and the result of requiring Great Britain to have an alliance with France and Russia is what led directly to Great Britain's involvement in World War I. Uh, and all of the men that they lost in the trenches, uh, in Flanders Fields as they called it, uh, the stalemate on the Western Front, uh, all of that was a result of these German naval laws that required Great Britain to make an alliance with France to defend the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean was fairly safe. The Aust Austrians did not have as many ships uh, and there was never really a threat to that sea line of communication. After the war, there's a new law that Japan passes, requiring eight battleships and eight battle cruisers. And it was interpreted to be less than eight years old. So this starts another revolution in terms of alliances, in terms of threats. The threat is now in the Pacific. The United States is directly involved because of our Pacific coast and Hawaii, I'll get to that. Uh, Great Britain is involved because of all her colonies in Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong. And, and we wind up with these very huge authorizations. The 1919 US authorization was for 10 battleships and six battle cruisers all with 16-inch guns. The British 1921 estimates were for the, quote, G3 battlecruisers, four of them with 16-inch guns, and N3 battleships with 18-inch guns. All, of the, all but four of these ships are over 40,000 tons in displacement. Our battleships were 43,000 tons. The British were 48,000 tons. Now, the Japanese are building at the same time. They have the Nagato class of eight 16-inch guns, the Kaga class of 10 16-inch guns, the Ki class of eight 18-inch guns, and four 16-inch gun battle cruisers of the Amagi class, all under construction. And the Japanese are really upset at the Americans because of our racist attitude toward Japanese immigration to the United States, our open door policy in China because Japan felt that China should be their sphere of influence, uh, and Japan gets divided in terms of their hierarchy. There's a fleet faction that wants to continue this 8-8 program indefinitely, and there's a faction that says, we probably can't afford this, it'll bankrupt the country. That's called the treaty faction. And these two factions politically are opposed to each other. Oops, I want to go back, I think. John! <laughs> oh, 
Oh, I think there's a what if slide in there someplace. There it is. There is. What if? Okay. What if? This, well, first of all, this treaty happens. And this treaty requires the scrapping of those in America, those six battle cruisers, and ten, uh, excuse me, eight of the battleships. All of the British ships are to be scrapped. All but two of the Japanese ships are to be scrapped. All of the obsolete and obsolescent warships are to be scrapped. Millions of tons of scrap steel will suddenly fall on the scrap metal market uh, worldwide. France is going to scrap things. Italy is going to scrap things. All of the armaments from the First World War, all of that steel is being scrapped. It's all being dumped on the scrap metal market. The shipbuilding industry in the United States, Great Britain, Japan to a lesser extent, France, Italy, virtually collapses. There's a glut of commercial shipping because of all of the ships that were built during the war and those obsolescent ships which are not as economically viable as the newer ones that were built during the war also are being scrapped. The armament industry collapses. Uh, there are no, there's no demand anymore for big guns. Uh, the equipment to build those things is very unique uh, and therefore if there is no demand that equipment gets scrapped. Armor. There is no demand for any of the armor which is a very specialized steel making process. Huge hundred ton billets of steel forged to a shape and then uh, conditioned with carbon to make one face of it extremely hard. That all goes away. Ex as I said, the excess and obsolescent commercial shipping goes away. Steel production goes down because there's not as much demand. There's not as much demand for mined iron ore. There's not as much demand for coal to fuel the steel making process or coke, which is vital to steel making. And coke is a derivative from coal where all of the impurities have been taken out, essentially pure carbon. As I said, the warships are required to be scrapped and the armaments from World War I are required to be scrapped. So, as I went to go write this book, I said, what if? What if this fleet faction and treaty faction had a different outcome? Because in Japan, many of their political fights were solved by assassination. So, what I hypothesized was that the head of the Japanese delegation in Washington, an admiral, uh, and I will never pronounce, pronounce this correctly, Tomosaburo Kato is assassinated the night before the second plenary session when Secretary of, of the State Hughes is going to lay out all of these major reductions in the world's fleets. Clearly the Japanese are upset. There is no FBI. It's the Washington Metropolitan Police Department that's called in to try to solve this problem. All the resources of the federal government but the reality is the treaty faction members of the Japanese delegation that remain are now in fear of their lives. So they go home. Without the Japanese signing on to the treaty and all those battleships being built in the Pacific, 
The United States has no option but to continue building its 1919 <coughs> program. The British have no option but to continue their 1921 estimates. And I hypothesize that this just continues going on until Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, and Hirohito decide to commit the world to war again at about the time period of the Second World War, 1939. Now my novel takes place in April of 1942. The Battle of the Atlantic is at a critical stage. There's a German task force that managed to break out through the Denmark Strait, but in the process was damaged by the Royal Navy uh, and went to Brest in France, Hitler conquered France, uh, to be repaired. And the French underground has been keeping the intelligence services aware of how the progress is being made towards the repair of these ships. And they're getting very close to being ready to sail. Brest obviously is a difficult place for the Royal Navy to blockade. There is still a huge German fleet in Wilhelmshaven and the Jade Bay. So the home fleet is tied down in Scapa Flow. Norway has been occupied by the Germans. Uh, so there's, there's really not much that the British can do. They ask the Americans, can you help us with this? And my novel is based on what the Americans are going to do to solve this problem and to prevent this German raiding group from getting out in the Atlantic, destroying the British convoys, which will inevitably result in the starvation of Great Britain and Churchill's acquiescence to surrender. And without Great Britain, you can imagine how bad the Allied, or now American, position was. One of the things that intrigued me when I was a captain of a submarine and went down to Roosevelt Roads in Puerto Rico was a tour that I was given of the base, and they pointed out the buildings that were built for the king and queen of Great Britain to occupy if Britain surrendered so that the, the colonies would stay in the war and that Roosevelt Roads was being set up as a base for the remainder of the Royal Navy uh, that existed after the surrender. Now, fictions about characters, uh, which I learned the hard way. Uh, and I say the hard way because uh, when I first wrote it, I wrote it about battles and ships uh, and aircraft and submarines. Uh, and I sent it off to uh, an editor who I found online by the name of Connie Buchanan. Connie Buchanan was the editor for The Hunt for Red October. And Connie sent me back, after I paid her a lot of money, uh, sent me back my novel with more red ink of her comments than my black ink, and it was 120,000 words. Well, I gave up. <laughs> I didn't know how to write a novel. So well, after a while, I started thinking about it and said, OK, novels are about really characters. So I've got to make a character. And I made Captain Shepard McLeod. Uh, and I gave him an interesting background. Uh, he was an extremely successful leader and naval officer. He was exceptional at sea. He had command of a destroyer, had command of a light cruiser. And when the war started uh, with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, he was in command of the battle cruiser Shenandoah. Uh, now, they had just been outfitted with a Mark III radar, brand new to the Pacific. Uh, Vice Admiral Trotter, who was the commander of the scouting force, decided that they needed to know exactly what this new piece of radar could do uh, at sea rather than just what the tech manual said. So after the fleet came back to Pearl Harbor on Friday, 
the Shenandoah and the destroyer went northwest of Hawaii. Shepard decided that he would go into the bad weather up there to make sure he could find out exactly what the radar could do in the rain and the fog and everything else that was happening up there, which was shielding the Japanese coming to attack Pearl Harbor. Now, they already were outfitted with what was called a CXAM radar. Uh, that radar is basically an air search radar. And yes, the Shenandoah saw the Japanese attack waves going to Pearl Harbor. Shepard sent a message. One of the many messages that were ignored uh, on Sunday morning, December 7th. Uh, and as a result, the American fleet is both damaged and the channel to Pearl Harbor, which is narrow, was blocked. And Shepard doesn't know any of that. All he knows is that he knows where the Japanese planes came from. And his job as a scouting force is to find them and stay with them and radio their positions so that the American fleet can come and destroy the Japanese. Well, he finds them. And they're not in a battle formation, they're in an anti-submarine formation. And they're not heading west back to Japan, they're headed east towards the west coast of the United States. Well, Shepard's radioing this positions and whatnot, and he's not getting any answers uh, as to what's going to happen. So on his own initiative, in this bad weather, he decides that he's going to use this new gunnery radar that he's just found out the details of and start lobbing 16-inch shells into the Japanese formation uh, where he thinks the aircraft carriers are. Uh, and that's what he does. And he starts out doing that. And he sees three of those radar blips that he thinks are the carriers slow and fall out of formation. And that's when the escorts for the Japanese find the Shenandoah. And they start blasting away, and Shepard makes a run for it. Uh, he's not that successful. The Shenandoah is badly damaged. One of the hits they get is on the superstructure, where there's a fire that develops. The damage control party's there, trying to put it out with their fire hoses, and another hit happens. Uh, and that, that damage control party is literally obliterated. And that happened right in front of Shepard's eyes as he was looking through one of the command slits in the command tower. And the blood and the bone and the flesh from those men pepper his face. Within seconds, there's another hit on the command tower this time. And Shepard is thrown across it. His left leg is badly damaged. Uh, his femur is, I don't want to say shattered, because there was enough of it left that they, surgeons could put it back together again. Uh, but many of the men that he had been standing with are now dead or dying or badly wounded. One of Shepard's crew members, uh, Petty Officer Raimondo de Jesus Cruz, bosun's mate, who is his uh, gig coxswain, and several others carry Shepard to the battle dressing station, and his ship surgeons manage to stabilize his leg, not amputate it. Uh, clearly, Shepard's not fit to command. His exo takes over. They find out that the harbor to the Channel to Pearl Harbor is closed, so they go to San Diego, and Shepard spends a month in Balboa Naval Hospital having his leg operated on, one operation after another to try to piece it together and line it up and get it to heal right. Uh, and during that time period, he starts having nightmares and flashbacks. Uh, now, to try to make sure I had Shepard McLeod, correct. I had the novel reviewed by a clinical psychologist as well as a clinical therapist with great experience with PTSD because I wanted to make sure 
that how I presented Shepard was accurate. Now, in the Second World War, as John said, the men that suffered from PTSD had to hide it. It was considered cowardice. You may remember a very famous incident where a, uh, a, a soldier suffering from, quote, shell shock was slapped by General Patton in Sicily, and he's lost his command of the Third Army as a result uh, because he wasn't sensitive enough. But for a leader, if you had PTSD, you had to hide it. So my character, Shepard McCloud, throughout the novel is hiding this thing. But when bad things happen, he immediately goes back to that command tower and thinking of the men he lost. There's a hit on the command tower of the Argonne during the battle, and he thinks his friends have now been obliterated, and he goes almost catatonic uh, until the command tower calls him up for some direction and he can't believe that they're all still alive. Uh, but they're alive because he had just turned at the last minute and therefore the shell just wrecked the bridge rather than enter the command tower. Uh, but you can't just have one protagonist. You have to have a host of characters. And that gets me to Corvetten Captain Hans Dieter Meyer, Kriegsmarine, commander of U-197, part of Operation, and I'll get it right, Beckenschlag. Now what's Beckenschlag mean? It's a symbol crash. Why did I do that? Because I didn't want to say Pockenschlag, which was drumbeat, the actual operation that Derneth put in motion. It's the same operation. Uh, he has a t in command of a Type 9 U-boat, and he's been assigned to the premier patrol area off the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. And he, this operation is going to start the same day that the American task force sails from Norfolk. The drama builds. I'm not going to tell you the results, but Hans Dieter Meyer suddenly becomes a key element in whether the task force will be able to accomplish its mission or not. Because the Americans only have two battle cruisers and two carriers. The Germans have two carriers and four battle cruisers. The odds against the Americans are pretty bad. Now, the, the leader of the German raiding group is Vice Admiral Klaus Schroeder. Now, Meyer, I'm going to go back a little bit, is already, has already been awarded the Knight's Cross, which means he's already sunk 100,000 tons of shipping. His dream, which he dreams of every night, is to have sunk 200,000 tons or sunk a major warship uh, like uh, Gunter Peen did, sinking the Royal Oak, so that he'll get the Knight's Cross with swords, which Hitler personally will give him. Meyer was in the Hitler Youth. His idol is Adolf Hitler. So he dreams of this, and he dreams of this glory. And maybe it fogs some of his decision making at a critical moment. Schroeder can't stand Hitler. He's a product of the Imperial Navy. Uh, but he knows that if he can get out in the Atlantic uh, and start sinking German or British convoys, like he did when he broke out, because he sank one, 38 ships. Uh, think in terms of the actual event of when Scharnhorst and Neisnau broke out into the Atlantic and started sinking merchant ships. Uh, that's Klaus Schroeder's dream, because he knows that will win the war, and he's going to be the hero. Rear Admiral Hamilton is in charge of the American task force. Aviator, good guy, has to deal with problems. Uh, there are 
events that are ambiguous. I try to write into the book the fog of war and how commanders and captains have to deal with the unknown and make decisions based on probability of outcomes. Admiral Sir Bruce Hardy is in charge of Force H. Now he's got Renown and Repulse and Arc Royal. And that's it. He doesn't have the forces to stop the Germans unless he can make a night torpedo attack. But the timing's wrong. But he's going to go out there and he's going to try because that's what the Royal Navy does. Squadron leader Rupert Wife Jones, RAF, is commanding 419 Squadron of Sunderland flying boats out of Pembroke Dock in South Wales. And his area of responsibility to search is the Bay of Biscay uh, and some of the Eastern Atlantic. Now, the book starts with them standing down to get a brand new radar fitted into the Sunderlands. So the, his Sunderlands are now the best search asset that the RAF has. Well, the fitting of that ASV-3 is just in time. And he sends them out. Shepard has some interesting characters working for him. Commander, Lieutenant Commander Bronco Billy Burdick is in charge of his scout op observation squadron. And Argon and her hangar are big enough so that he's actually got eight planes. OS-2U Kingfishers, Mod 7s. Because the Kingfisher never had folding wings during the war. But for my novel, they've got folding wings. And that's why they have a modification beyond where uh, they actually had during the war. Bronco Billy Burdick, he's a fighter pilot at heart. He's also devastatingly handsome. <laughs> and, that, and at the end of the novel, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that the photograph of him with his flying helmet, his traditional white scarf, fl flight jacket, a little bit of uh, exhaust fumes on his face, goes into the Philadelphia Inquirer, and rumor has it, it's posted in all of the dormitories, female dormitories, of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, John William Hamlin IV. Well, as the fourth indicates, he's the fourth generation of a long line of naval officers. His great-grandfather, John William Hamlin I, was a hero in the, in the uh, Civil, War. Civil War. Thanks, Chris. Chris is, Chris is my help here. Uh, his grandfather was a hero of the Spanish-American War. His father was the head of the Navy just before Admiral King. Now, the captain of the Argonne, when she was built, uh, got a phone call from Admiral Hamblin and said, please help my son and put him in a position where he can recover his reputation. They didn't know anything about him. But John William Hamblin IV, I will say, has been badly damaged by his first commanding officer who will never serve in command again. Uh, and one of Shepard's really great leadership problems is what to do. Because John William Hamblin IV happens to be the director officer of the, direct, the gun director at the top of Argonne. There's no way to get to him. There's no way anybody can supervise him. 
There's no way that he's not going to affect the battle outcome because that director has the best view and the longest range of any of the ones on board the Argonne. Lieutenant Commander Jonathan Becker. He, in today's world, would be called a geek. He's got some problems with Navy etiquette. And he doesn't pick up on the Navy social cues. And he doesn't necessarily wear his uniform correctly or even the right uniform at times. But Jonathan Becker is absolutely brilliant. And it takes a while for Shepard to learn what Becker, as his CIC officer, can do for him. And that eventually plays a critical role at the end of the book. I've talked about Boson's mate, Ramondo De Jesus Cruz, who was with Shepard on the Shenandoah. And when it was rumored that Shepard would be going to Argonne, many of his shipmates were sent there deliberately so that Shepard would have a group of people he could rely on without having to learn immediately what people could do or couldn't do. Cruz is one of them. He's in charge of the, the gig, as well as one of the 40 millimeter gun mounts. Uh, Commissary Steward First Class, George Washington Carver Jefferson. The Navy of 1942 was very segregated, okay? George Washington Carver Jefferson grew up in the cotton fields of Alabama. Uh, but he is another one of uh, people that is absolutely dedicated to Shepard. They have this little funny tradition every morning uh, of it's another fine Navy day uh, as a greeting. Uh, Jefferson knows everything about him. It turns out that Jefferson's also a loader on this 40 millimeter mount that uh, Cruz is commanding. Lieutenant Barry Jensen is the second best flyer that Shepard has. Arthur Wesley Roberts is the navigator of the Argonne. Interesting leadership challenge. Arthur does not want command. Shepard has to figure out why and hopefully by the end of the novel get him enthusiastic about what command is so that Arthur will go on. Commander Charles Thurgood Williamson is a gunnery officer. Kind of cocky. Thinks he knows everything. Uh, pretty good. Uh, he was responsible for bringing the 40 millimeter uh, mounts uh, to fruition in the United States Navy. And now he is the gunnery officer on the Argonne. Uh, a little cocky. Maybe he cut some corners that he shouldn't. Ted Grabowski is the EXO. Great guy, just too junior to command a battle cruiser. But he kept that ship going after the first captain died of a heart attack on the bridge, coming back to Norfolk. Rear Admiral Ray Calhoun, salt of the earth, sailor at heart, great tactician. Ray deliberately makes the Bella Wood his flagship rather than the Argonne because the Bella Woods captain is all of the worst things you can think of in terms of a pompous, Washington-only service, escorting admirals' wives to dances, and he thinks his command of the Bella Wood is his just reward only long enough to get his, quote, capital ship command ticket punched so he can leave and go back to Washington. Uh, he's a micromanager. That's a problem. Now the novel I wrote, I tried to make absolutely exact in terms of the customs, the traditions of the Navy, the equipment, the cover that you saw, I sat down with blueprints for the Mark 38 director and converted them into CAD drawing. The same with the Mark 34 director, 
the same with the Mark 37 director, the same with the radars, uh, as well as design the ship. The procedures to operate those pieces of equipment are laid out in there. The procedures for the guns are laid out uh, very accurately. Uh, Argonne is equipped with 5-inch 54s, which were going to be on the Montana-class battleships. Uh, she's equipped with 6-inch 55s, a gun that was probably a progression of what uh, the U.S. was doing, as well as 18-inch 55s, very long-range weapons. There's a new concept of battle cruisers uh, to be very high speed and very long range to such that if an enemy is found, say a carrier task force, during the night, they can steam at high speed and engage them with gunfire before the aircraft are launched uh, safely. That's part of the operation. And then there's the operational art, something that I taught. The operational art is how you accomplish the mission that you're assigned with the assets that you have. Well, Shepard's got this ship. Beautiful ship, very high speed. It's 1,296 feet waterline length, 130,000 tons. Now, is there any engineer, are there any engineers here? Okay, well. The limitation on shaft horsepower is the reduction gear. Uh, you can't get, with the laws of mechanical engineering, beyond about 75,000 on one shaft. So I had to design a new reduction gear that would allow me to get 150,000 shaft horsepower on one shaft. Using that, I now have a ship that's capable of speeds in the high 40s. Uh, the hull, if you go and do something called the hull speed, a Fletcher class destroyer is 26 knots, an IO class battleship is 35 knots, and the Argonne is 49 knots. Now what hull speed means is the point of transition between when a ship is slicing through the pressure wave that's building in front of it and when it has to start climbing over that pressure wave. And if you look at all of the pictures of high-speed destroyers, they're kind of pointed up and their sterns are down as they're trying to make this impossible climb over a pressure wave. Those of you that have small boats, you climb over the pressure wave all the time and just plane. The novel's been reviewed. Part of iUniverse, which I contracted to publish this, and it's a vanity publisher, which means you pay, they publish. Uh, I contracted with Kirkus, Blue Ink, and Clarion to uh, review it. They are supposedly very honest. They will tell you whether it's any good or not. Kirkus is the hardest one to get a positive review out of, and they put me in the top 5%. Blue Ink gave me a starred review which put me in the top 6% of all the books that they, they looked at, and they looked at 3,000 books a year. Clarion Forward gave me five stars. Reader reviews on Amazon, so far I have 14 reviews. 13 are five star, there's one four star. On iUniverse, my publisher, there are four reviews. They're all five stars. Uh, so I have been incredulous at the reception that the book has gotten from the world of publishing. And I will never make any money off of it. Because I'll tell you that if you're not writing about zombies, <laughs> or warlocks, or what's called chick lit romance novels, uh, you're probably not going to have something with wide distribution. or you can be famous and hire a ghostwriter. And then those people will make lots of money, like Hillary Clinton with 220,000 books uh, out, uh, out there to be bought. So that's my book. 
And if you're looking for a good read, and I assume everybody here is kind of interested in the Navy, uh, kind of interested in interesting interactions between characters, uh, I would ask you to buy it. And if you do it today, I would be happy to stay and sign it for you. And I will tell you that the first place I tried to market my book was on Amazon.com. If you send them a Microsoft Word file with a cover illustration, they'll put it out there. And I did that. And it was a mistake. It sold 13 copies. I took it down when I went to the publisher. One of those 13 sold for $190 on Amazon UK recently because it's the first edition. And I deliberately made this the second edition. Uh, I did keep three copies. Now I'm hoping that the price keeps going up <laughs> so I can maybe recover some of the thousands and thousands of dollars that I put into uh, trying to get this published and trying to get it to be a good novel. Now, a lot of the reviews on Amazon are, when's the sequel coming out? Well, the sequel is right now at a bunch of agents for their consideration, and I'm hopeful because it's been two months since I sent it to them and they haven't said no. Uh, it's also with a publisher uh, for several months and I sent them an email because I wanted to try to get it better and I was going to go back to my second editor, uh, John Kudrick, uh, to have him give me comments on it. He gave me a preliminary indication, but I mean a real thorough scrub. Uh, and they said, no, don't spend any money on it. We'll do that uh, for you. So I'm hopeful. Now this novel went down to the United States Naval Institute for their consideration for a year. And it got through every single chop until the last one. And then they said no. So I wasted a year. I'd love to entertain your questions. Yes? What, was, what started that? My friend that told me, I, I've got to stay within the view line, or John gets <laughs> mad at me. Uh, my motivation, my friend, was actually my therapist because in command of my third submarine, uh, I almost killed a shipyard worker. Uh, we were getting ready for sea trials. I was the commander of the pre-commissioning unit of the SSBN Rhode Island. Uh, and some little bird in the back of my head said, go look at the missile deck again. And I looked, and just as I looked, a paintbrush came up in between the fairings of the missile muzzle hatches. Now what we were, I was about to order, and would have ordered except for the little bird in the back of my head, was what was called a battle readiness test. We flop all, the mis all 24 of these missile muscle hatches as fast as we can, 11 second intervals, because that's the launch interval for Trident two missiles, okay? Uh, and I would have killed several painters uh, that were, in, were, not to my knowledge, in the superstructure trying to get the ship ready for sea trials. Uh, the next day, I started suffering from hallucinations, and I reported myself as unfit for command. Uh, and my gold crew CO took the ship out. And they continued with their record setting performance. They set the records which will never be broken for initial criticality and power range testing time for sea trials time. Uh, and it's a, it was a great, great crew. But the Navy did not like the fact that I was no longer available to the Navy, and they wreaked their havoc on my XO, because they th felt that he hadn't taken up enough of the burden that was on me, and he had nothing to do with that. And to this day, I regret that that happened. So that was my motivation, because my friend and therapist said, why don't you write? And I'll tell you that it has been the best therapy I ever had. 
putting into Shepard what I personally knew. Uh, I had command of three different submarines. One of them I got in a 15 second ceremony on two hours notice. And it was a turnaround job, which you can imagine. Uh, and that, that was probably the first thing that started ma making a major effect on my health. Uh, the stress compressed the vertebrae in my neck enough uh, that I was in agony from pain in my left arm. Uh, and I hid that as long as I could, just like Shepard, until finally we had to report it to the squadron commander. And he almost fired the medical officer on the spot because he knew the medical officer had known about it and hadn't told the Commodore. Uh, but got a new captain. Uh, the crew was phenomenal. Uh, they uh, demanded a full change of command ceremony. They gave me, uh, to this day, my most prized possession, which was the ship's wheel. Uh, now, it wasn't the actual wheel, it was a wooden one. Uh, and with the ship's plaque, and underneath it, there's an engraved plaque that says, you bought this, brought the spirit back. Because the ship's motto, SSN 676, was the spirit of 76. Uh, and that's why they said, I brought the spirit back. Uh, and the Navy, looking for a place for me to go, sent me here to the War College uh, as the uh, Lockwood Chair of Undersea Warfare, uh, which I did for a little while. Uh, remember I told you the story about Admiral Rickover? That turned out to be very important because I was actually assigned to the Department of Energy a joint tour. So I became a joint service officer as a result of that. And when Admiral Stark was looking around for somebody to take over JMO, when the guy that was there suddenly decided to retire and go to Saudi Arabia, uh, I was of the right seniority and a joint service officer. So I got it until they could find a permanent relief. Well. The model of the Admiral's Barge back there is, has great significance for me because shortly after that, the Admiral decided to take all the senior management out on a night cruise to talk about this, that, or the other thing, which was his want. And uh, I was sitting next to him in the stern sheets uh, and he proposed that all of the students should be ranked based on their class standing at the end of their year in their fitness reports. And I've never been one to uh, hold my tongue very well. And I said, dumb idea. <laughs> Under my breath, Admiral Stark heard it, and I had to defend my position. And after I defended it, he decided not to have the students uh, who were the best and the brightest and had come from very stressful jobs to have another stressful job, but rather have a job that they just needed to pass. Uh, and I got that job, and I had, held it for five years uh, because the Navy didn't have any other use for me. Uh, and we had, we had a lot of fun. I managed to get a lot of other excess captain submariners to fill a lot of billets around the War College. And yes, the submarine force was taking over the war college during that time <laughs> period. <laughs> Very surreptitiously, but we were doing it. Uh, and, and this was probably my number two uh, tour that I mo enjoyed the most. Uh, mostly because I was still suffering from that incident uh, on the Rhode Island at the time. And I really couldn't engage the faculty the way I wanted to. Uh, and my all-time favorite was winning to get fired and being told to leave the building on five minutes notice, which was Admiral Rickover's typical mode of operation. You're fired! Get out of here! <laughs> <laughs> and it happened once to a captain uh, on his staff while I was down there. It was, you know, get out of here! And uh, Captain Severance called Mr. Wagner, the deputy, from the lobby, because he was out of the building, <laughs> said, the Admiral just fired me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mr. Wagner was an amazing man and knew how to work with Rickover. 
And after a while, Admiral Severance was formally brought back into the Naval Nuclear Power Program and his record restored. So, did I answer your question? And how long ago did you begin the book? I started in 2006. Uh, and uh, as I said, I, I went chapter by chapter. I had a group of people that I'd never met uh, who did the reviews, for, who would review the chapter at a time for me. Uh, one was an aviator from the Second World War, flying from carriers. Another was a machinist mate uh, from the Second World War. Uh, and this group of people would give me comments and say, no, it doesn't work that like that. There are no valves here. I think it's submarines, you know. Uh, uh, so I got those details from those reviewers. Uh, I went through about 14 changes for each of those chapters. Then I made one major revision. And then I sent it off to Con Connie Buchanan. Another two revisions. Sent it to John Kudrick. Another revision. And what finally went to iUniverse was the sixth revision. And iUniverse asked me to change about five of the scenes that are in it, which I did. Uh, and that's what was published. Now, I believe that there's a good book in everyone. And for all of you, I really hope you will take the time to sit down and write your memoirs. Whether it gets published or not, it is going to be priceless for your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, etc. Uh, just like the oral histories are that are going on now, but uh, not everybody gets to do those. So my recommendation is to write. That's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun building characters and trying to keep them mentally straight uh, in your mind so that their interactions make sense uh, and it's a lot of fun uh, and when I do the, did the battles and whatnot the first thing I did was take a chart and lay it all out so I got all the times and the bearings uh, correct uh, and my son's telling me I've run out of time so <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you very much Again, I will say the book is downstairs for those of you interested. It's in the bookstore. Good read. You had one. I just want to thank you for your presentation, and most of all, thank you for your honesty. Oh, thank you. It's uh, refreshing. I know, and that's probably been my great advantage or disadvantage in terms of uh, my career was, you know, truth to power. Sir. Did the battleships of World War II have a command tower? Yes, they, they did. A... Uh, if you go to Fall River and see the battleship Massachusetts, you will see the, many of the pieces of equipment uh, and the layout of the ship that's similar to Argon. But remember, this ship is twice as long, one and a half times as wide, and four times the displacement. What did you have for fire control in your ship? The same thing that's in the Massachusetts, a Ford Mark I computer. And uh, uh, Ford isn't the Ford Automotive. There was another Ford uh, who worked exclusively for the Navy developing fire control instruments. And he developed an analog computer that was uh, on board all of the, virtually all of the Navy warships from battleships to destroyers uh, for surface gunfire control as well as any aircraft gunfire control. That's all mechanical computer. All mechanical analog computer uh, using gears and very finely made uh, uh, spindles uh, and, and cams uh, to, to do the calculations uh, that were necessary. I met the Admiral or the full in charge of reactivating battleships. Oh, wow. And uh, he was saying that the electronics people came in and said, throw that junk out, we'll put our stuff in. <laughs> yeah. Uh -uh. And one salvo destroyed all the electronics. Yep, yep. <laughs> no, uh, the 
Ford Mark I was a great piece of equipment, and Argonne has, let me think, eight, uh, 12 of them. Uh, she's got eight Mark 37 directors, two Mark 34 directors for her six inch mounts, and uh, two uh, Mark 38 directors. <coughs> 